with the big b patch in 24 hours to 13.14 what's the best comps to play well i got you here are my top five most consistent and powerful compositions that you'll be seeing in each lobby Let's talk about Aphelios and Dead Eyes to get things started. A lot of times when you play this composition, you want to be as flexible and open as you can around the concept of playing at least three Freljords plus two Dead Eyes. A lot of times you end up capping out with, say, an Aphelios 2 and an Urgot 2 with Scion and potentially Heimerdinger, but in reality, you're going to have to play whatever you hit. If you don't end up hitting Heimerdinger, but let's say you hit an Aatrox, you can just play that Aatrox because currently he's really good in the metagame. Or if you just don't hit this Heimerdinger and you hit a Senna instead, just play that. The most important thing is you just stall for enough time for Aphelios to get stacks on his Rage Blade to be able to get that attack speed and eventually kill everything. And then have supplementary damage to Urgot and Akshan and maybe even that Ash. A lot of these items are just recommended based off if you have extra of them. Obviously, in terms of the priority, the most important thing is a Rage Blade on Aphelios plus a Death Blade. Attack damage is really important in order to get the kills with the Dead Eyes as well as scale all that attack speed on Aphelios. This is why things like Social Distancing is so good on Aphelios and also for other augments that just straight up give you a death blade like a cut above suppressing fire is also a really good augment now i especially want to call this out because they doubled it from four to eight seconds they they they, they 2x the power of this augment like surely it has to be good it turns out it's actually really really good because if suppressing fire doesn't straight up kill them with the dead eye proc you'll be able to have the reduced damage so that way as the fight drags on you'll be able to potentially neuter all their backline dps in terms of the extra plus ones a lot of people would think you want to go for like dead eye plus one and whatnot maybe even bruiser but in reality failure heart is really good this is because four failure is pretty ridiculous if you get a team wide stun for 1.5 seconds for anybody that played dragon lands you remember tempest it was kind of like that it was very very effective team-wide stun which is really huge in this comp if you're not able to find heimerdinger for the top end you can usually just play like Tarek as a temporary unit to get that targon in and Tarek's actually surprisingly useful if you end up playing a lot of healing augments let's say you're playing like a harm assist or something else that just gives you healing it ends up having your frontline and backline sustained that much more one item that i want to call out to if you end up playing something like a Tarek and targon version of this board is locket i think the new locket that moves one hex to the left and right to give that shield buff now is actually surprisingly pretty decent when you play any kind of targon and Tarek boards but it's something that i don't want to pay for with my normal resources something that i end up picking up later in the game let's say a stage five stage six carousel or if you just get an item anvil later on that you already have all of your other items taken care of feel free to build that locket on Tarek, which is surprisingly really good in this spot don't go out of your way to make some of these items though you know for example if you already have sunfire don't bother with morel and lissandra these are just ur extra urgot items you can also just play straight up deathblade on him if you want this last whisper on ash is also just in case because sometimes you need that extra armor sundering even after the failure storm in the end you still want to put items on scion too if you do end up hitting him just get anything defensive on him it's really good the second variation of frailer dead eyes that a lot of people end up playing is Akshan. this is because you end up rolling at seven and you go for a reroll on seven strategy and try to go for say three star Akshan and Lissandra instead and so by going for three star Akshan and Lissandra you end up stacking Lissandra with more items like Archangel Staff maybe a Jewel Gauntlet and you'd be surprised at how much DPS this Lissandra is able to put out if you're able to get her to three star that being said Lissandra is way more contested right now because invokers are more popular so just be careful about that don't chase it if it's not practical a couple of these units are also flexible as well let's say if you end up hitting all of this and you need to move up to eight you can replace Renekton instead with a Cassante and then you end up hitting Scion instead and this is a good level eight that you can play around and obviously itemize with whatever you can Val blue buff is still really good on a Cassante one thing to keep in mind is that if you do end up having a situation where you hit Nasus because you hit Nasus 2 and you're stuck on Sidrani 1 you do end up having Nasus sometimes take the Ascension if you have really good high HP on him but let's say instead of having warmogs and all these tanky items you're just playing like, like sunfire and like bt nasus it's not really worth ascending him because he doesn't have that much tankiness to it so you're better off guaranteeing Akshan. and remember with the changes to the patch you can just guarantee that by taking Akshan out of the board and replacing it back in the most recent unit placed will get that ascension buff based on the Sharima. let's talk about the early game build up there's two primary ways that you build around which is one usually around the dead eyes or two usually around the Sharima. we start off with the dead eye with Jin, ash renekton shogath this isn't a simple way to get that frontline backline going you just have the two bruisers in the front two dead eyes in the back you can also just play irelia and set 
and therefore you have three Ionia, and that's also still a really strong core early game. The easiest times to go for Shirima is when you do hit the early Akshan off of an orb, and that's usually when people commit to play this comp the most often. In this case, you end up playing things like Renekton and say like uh, a Cassiopeia. The only downside is your frontline is pretty weak, uh, so you usually don't really want to do this unless you're able to get like a two-star Renekton. Otherwise, you end up just having a very vulnerable frontline. You might as well cut that Shirima and not actually go for it. This Cassiopeia could just be at one star for a long time, and you end up hitting like other Bruiser units. Don't be afraid to just go play four Bruiser. It's actually quite solid of an early mid game now that they buffed it. From here, you notice that you're missing a Shirima or a Void or a Failure. You can pretty much just tech it in whatever you are missing. So in this case, you just play a Lissandra on seven and you could roll for a board like this until you end up finding things like the Sejuani. Take out Cho, take out Vi, put in that Sejuani. Then you take out that Rek'Sai, add in a Shirima. It could be this Nasus. But don't be afraid of just like hanging on to Cassiopeia to link with that Invoker. And this is still a pretty decent level six if you're able to high roll early with Sejuani. And there's always nothing wrong of just playing like an Urgot at seven. This is something that you actually can play for quite some time. I think a lot of people feel like playing three Deadeye is really awkward, but Hey, if there's another person using another Deadeye proc and potentially sniping a backline unit, it could be really huge. The one thing I do want to emphasize is you want to make sure that your Deadeyes are upgraded. Playing a one-star Ash and a one-star Urgot is not worth it because their Deadeye auto attacks are not going to kill anything. The three priority lists that I would really focus on are one, make sure you have really good items like on Auction and Aphelios for the AD aspect of things. Two, focus on good economy and HP, but mainly about the economy because the comp can get really expensive whether or not you're choosing for a three star or going for level eight to hit all these four and five costs. And the third would be to finally secure your win condition through hitting Akshan three or finally getting four Deadeye. Four Deadeye is most likely something you're going to try to get at level eight, but sometimes you have to make do and roll for it at seven because you don't have anything better. A couple things I want to mention in addition is the legend recommendation one, which is probably going to be around Orn items, which if you do get a good frontline like Eternal Winter and Anima Visage is totally fine. If you get Gold Collector, that is probably Akshan's best item in general. So this is partially why a lot of people really like having Gold Collector and Orn Artifacts available for Akshan. Number's Focus is probably better on Aphelios than it is on Akshan, so don't try to force it on Akshan if it doesn't really make sense. And if you also want other generic combat augments that are really good, just play something like Poro. Or if you want items, go for Ezreal because you want a lot of those AD items and swords. I just want to say that positioning for Akshan has started to evolve a lot, which is some people really want to keep the middle open because Akshan fires down the center towards as far as target. So if you draw the aggression to the corners instead, Akshan might be able to snipe and get a free field goal down the middle to hit that top corner carry. But I've also seen this backfire where like this doesn't really do anything and ends up griefing other positioning for other reasons. So just keep this in mind that this is an option and not the way you're supposed to default. Lux Sorcerers is really powerful right now and also has changed a little bit from the variations we talked about previously. The first thing that I want to note is that the comp has now gotten way more dependent on not just rods, but tiers. In the past, when you had multiple tiers, you didn't really know what to do with it because they weren't really super efficient outside of making like one item like Shojin, for example. But now with the changes to some of the mana items, you really do want to have blue buff now, primarily on Lux, Felcaus, and Ari. So ideally having a lot of mana sources is really good. That's why things like Overcharge Mana Font are really good because it just gives you a lot of mana every time you get a takedown. And I want to give a special shout out to Lee Sin's Augment, Gotta Go Fast, which is something that just generates more raw mana. So if I would recommend a legend, I would try to see if you can go for Lee Sin so you can play Gotta Go Fast and generate more mana or maybe you end up picking something that gives you a lot more items to select the tiers like Bard or Ezreal so you get more components. If you have a Sorcerer's Crest, for example, you can just hit this all on seven. You don't even need Ari. And all of a sudden you recognize that you have six Sorcerer, three Demacia, and the Multicast Strategist. A lot of times if you can't find Jarvan because he's just too expensive, you just want to play a cheaper version of your board, you can just play Kassadin instead so you can get that Void and get that Remora in the front line. And this is a really common way that you can set up your board. Even if you don't have Lux, you still can play Orianna as well and have Orianna hold all of the Lux items. The nice thing about this board is that notice that how cheap it is. In fact, you can roll for all of this on six and hold on to extra units that you don't play, like the Kassadin, for example. The sooner you can get six Orc, the better, because remember that it ends up giving you twice the amount of shocks. At six, you get more AP, more max damage, and also twice as many enemies, which is just an insane amount of DPS. So at level six, if you have that plus one Sorcerer, always try to fit in six Sorcerer if you can. Velkos ends up being your carry sometimes because that's just the unit they have to roll for, especially if you're stuck at seven, you're not hitting your Lux, you're not hitting that Jarvan, you're just stuck on rolling for ones and twos and three costs. 
then just play around Velkaz and maybe chase for Sona 3 as well. I realized I didn't have Ionic Spark earlier. This is actually really important. Make sure you always prioritize some kind of Shred. Having Static Shiv is also an alternative, but it's not nearly as clean because Sona would have to attack three times before you get the Shred going. And that's a little bit too late because if you have things like Blue Buff, you're casting so fast, you want to get that Magic Shred early on. So Spark is particularly better than Shiv in this comp. Although sometimes you don't really get to negotiate from it. Maybe you just don't have the ability to make Spark ever because you just don't get the rods with the cloaks. You got to make do with what you got. Here's like an early game buildup of how you usually get to it. Playing around Void is one of the strongest cores in the game at stage two. In fact, if you look at the stats, I believe this is top two comps that you can play on stage two alongside Ionia. And this is because you just get so much extra HP. Usually the Remora is like six, 700 HP early just for having this. And therefore you just have the sheer numbers advantage. Oriana ends up being a lot of times your item holder, but you can also put it on Malzahar too, which is surprisingly good in a shield based meta because destroying 50% of heals can be a really big deal if your opponent is dependent on the Merle. One thing to note is that if you do have an early Sorcerer Emblem, you do want to play around it if you can. You can put it, for example, on an early Cassidy and just play around, say, a Swain instead. And this would be what you would play until you eventually get the five and you just play like a random Void of some kind. Well, in the ideal scenario, you end up playing uh, around Velkaz, but it's kind of hard to hit Velkaz early. Another surprisingly really good holder of Sorcerer Emblem is Soraka because she just does so well with all that flat AP. And so if you do end up hitting that, of course, that links into Taric. And then at level six, let's say you finally find the six Sorcerer and you're not playing Void, but you still have a really, really strong board. Remember that if you use Malzahar as an item carrier to try to hold on to extra copies of it. So that way, if you're ever stuck in a situation where you want to move Malzahar items to say at Velkos 2, you can sell that Malzahar and still feel like you have access to that six sorcerer. It's always situational though. Sometimes it's not worth holding it if it's like making a really important gold threshold, like 20 gold, because you want to make sure that you're getting your economy going. At level seven, we can add in the cast in to get that front line. And all of a sudden, this is a really strong core level seven board that we can play until we find things like Lux and we find the Sona, and then we find the Jarvan for Demacia. If you do get an opportunity to play for Azorks, that usually requires you to play a plus two because it's just hard to fit all of that without just straight up dying. Usually the second Sorcerer Emblem ends up going on a frontline unit, so in this case it's Cassidy, but let's say you find that Jarvan instead. Jarvan will instead take that Sorcerer Emblem, which ends up being kind of nice, so that way you can have that extra mana for Jarvan to cast with quicker. In this scenario, you obviously drop the Malzahar and then you end up putting things like the blue buff instead on Ari so that she can just destroy everything. And this is a clean level eight. Also worth noting is that Sorcerer is really strong in some portals that give you extension of your comps for free. So things like the God's Willow Grove, which gives you an, an extra trait off your bench, or you go for things like Mars or Magnum, which is the Targon portal that gives you two Tactician's Crowns throughout the game. That's an easy way to go for eight sorcerers. Absolutely something to think about. I mean, just look at this damage. 120 AP, 20 max HP damage. It's just, it's just gross. Make sure that you always don't greed full Taric value when you're positioning Jarvan on the top left and top right. So that way you can get really good jumps with his ult. The other thing I want to shout out is Sona is really important for to be next to Velkaz because you do want to give that attack speed buff. But if Velkaz is not holding really important items, you can just go ahead and put it on Lux maybe Ari, just keep that in mind. Oriana is more of a flex spot. You can play Malzahar if you want to destroy shields, but sometimes Oriana is just helpful for survivability. And even though she did change her ability to be more auto attack focused, I still rather her take a little bit of aggression before other units because these are the more valuable sorcerers. Another thing I want to mention is the bridging the pass between invokers and sorcerers because they do end up sharing a good amount of the early game units centered around Taric. A lot of times your first rod wants to be committed to something like Spark, so you do end up wanting to flex around the concept of playing around invokers or sorcerers if you don't have something committal like the Sorcerer Crest. And so this is an alternative opening as a way for you to get things rolling. If you have JG and Spark and you want to toe the line between playing sorcerers or invokers, it's totally available to you from here you would add another frontline unit say like the swain so that way you can get the dps from the back line and combine it with the front line at level six you can add another strategist maybe you hit that timo and then at level seven you hit the velka so that you have the multicaster and you sub out the cassiopeia you find another sorcerer instead like lux and this is totally a fine way you can play your level seven until you eventually find the units that you want such as instead of timo and soraka you finally find a way to bridge into that sona and you hit that jarvan in this example I'm showing, you're playing four sorcerers, which is not ideal. Remember, four sorcerers is much weaker. So only play variations like this if you're just really not hitting your other stuff. Because the longer you stay on four sorcerer, the more likely you are to bot four. The three priorities that you want to make sure to have for this composition is to prioritize magic shred. Usually you put it on Swain, 
Tarek is not as reliable as a tank as Swain. Generally, you put MR Shred on Swain, but you could put it on Tarek if you want. Try not to put it on Jarvan because he dies and then usually dies. Instead, I usually put like Val on him. You get so much flat AP through Sorcerer and Strategist that you might as well go for Jewel Gauntlet over something like Archangel Staff or Death Cap. And Death Cap is also particularly hard to justify in this composition because it uses two rods. And those two rods can go for a Jewel Gauntlet of Spark as opposed to just a Death Cap. If you're playing around Orn items, the best that you can probably play around is either Eternal Winter on the front line like Swain or going for Mana Zane on a unit like Vel'Koz or Sona. If you're able to get Mana Zane on Ari in the late game, she is the best holder of it by a mile and ends up destroying all these kinds of boards. Ari might be the best Mana Zane user of all time. So if you have an opportunity to try it, go for it. You're going to see some pretty crazy results other items you can do like deathfire grasp on lux to bust tanks zonia's hourglass is also playable although it's a lot weaker than it used to be and then a hidden op item could be sniper's focus on sona but you would have to build around sona 3 velkos 3 instead and that's usually because you're not hitting things like ari and lux Next composition we talk about is Invokers. Invokers is the reason why we even had a B patch in the first place because Tarek was just way too good and the shielding with Soraka was just ridiculous amount of sustain. The most important thing that you want to figure out with this composition is how to get MR Shred and get to that six Invokers with Gunblade. If you're able to get Karma 3, chances are you're going to top two or top two the game. Although usually you have to make sure that you're not bleeding too much HP. Invokers do have a weak mid game because a lot of people get online and until you can get things like Shen 2 and a two star Tarek, you're usually going to have too fragile of a front line if you're just relying on Galio 2. Ari is the best holder of things like the Invoker Emblem. If you do end up hitting Ari here, you can cut Cassiopeia and just play another unit. Sometimes people play like Sejuani so they get extra presence in the front line. Or by the way, don't even be afraid of playing a second Taric sometimes if this is what you end up having. So that way you have a, a better front line. Some of the augments that I think is worth mentioning is if you get Loving Invocation, this is one of the best augments you could possibly get because it scales your ability power. So not only do you get tons of mana through the Invoker trait, now you get a bunch of AP every single time you cast, which is starting to get kind of crazy. If you played set eight for monsters attack this is basically heart and so heart scaling gets really ridiculous as you start to let the fights drag out invoker crest plus one is also really good because it's an opportunity for you to get that invoker crest onto ari for example and combat caster is just really ridiculous because the more you're casting the more you're shielding and that is the being synergized with targon because it increases your healing and shielding which by the way yes if you do end up finding vertical targon of some capacity like a plus one targon or still a corn's blessing it's also potentially really really good the biggest mistake that i see people make is that they play blue buff on karma or they play any kind of mana based item on karma and that's not important because she gets so much through the invoker trait if you think about it every three seconds she's getting all this mana burn First, it doesn't really make blue buff that efficient whatsoever so make sure if you do end up hitting a mana item it'd be someone who needs it so ari for example could use as much mana as she possibly could get so in this case i would put a blue buff on her and even if you don't have the invoker emblem it's actually still really good because ari contributes with the sorcerer and the ionia ties just like for akshan another out you could play for is lissandra so you can give opportunities for lissandra to carry items she's always good with Morello, for example, Archangels, GS. Instead of Archangels, you have a bunch of AP swords. Thanks to Loving Invocation, you can put a JG here. And if you go to nine, just go ahead and play something like Scion or Senna. Just ways to cap out your board. Heimerdinger is also totally fine. One thing I didn't mention that in the previous composition that I featured Heimerdinger is that a lot of people are putting triple Mechano right now just for max damage as they fix that bug. And this is usually a really good DPS source. This is particularly true if you already have a lot of shred sources, so you don't really need things like the shrink ray. Build up is pretty straightforward, especially if you have an invoker plus one. If you do find a way to get invoker out to Taric early, pretty much you're just going to guarantee five streak if you have any of these units two starred. In fact, a lot of people are picking the Caitlyn hero augment, so they can pick stars are born, so that way they can get things like Cassio one and Soraka two or Galio two and get that tempo really going early so you can get that invoker bonus so feel free to play around caitlin feel free to play around the generic stuff like poro i wouldn't recommend orn actually for this composition because the orn artifacts can get really weird you really just cut care about like the frontline items at most because mana zane is not that important for casting a lot and it's not even like things like zonia's is particularly really strong either so i wouldn't really recommend things like orn it doesn't even feel like dfg is that reliable instead i would probably prioritize things like bard or ezreal so you can get extra items 
If you don't have this Invoker emblem and you're just playing it at level four, you end up finding a fourth Invoker. In this case, we're just going to go with Lissandra. Feel free to tech in Bastions at any time to help provide some tankiness. So you can play Kassadin, for example. This also inversely works. So let's say you can't find Lissandra and Galio. You can just play all of the cheap Bastions. So that way you get some frontline presence. You would be surprised how strong Soraka can actually anchor, especially if you play things like Stars Are Born. Two-star Soraka with really good items ends up helping scale your front line. And this is a really strong way for you to build up your board to get to that level seven invoker board. At level seven, we find Karma. We find Shen. We cut to all of these different bastions. And we want to get to six invoker as fast as we can. The reality is sometimes if you're able to have that plus one invoker, by the way, you can just roll for it at six if you just cut the Shen instead and you add the invoker emblem. And congrats, now you have six invoker at level six. And then at eight, you add Ari. But if you don't have Ari, you can just play Lux temporarily so you can get that sorcerer damage and she absolutely can just hold things like the re item one thing you note is that shen really wants the defensive items more than Tarek does i think i see a lot of people stacking things like um Tarek with a bunch of tank defensive items but ultimately you still want to give it to shen because shen is the best tank in this composition who ends up shielding all of your units and empowers them so if you were to choose between a Tarek or a Shen, try to get those items onto Shen. But sometimes you're just stuck on Shen 1 for a long time. Maybe you somehow hit Galio 3 while you're rolling down to try to see if you can 3-star Karma. So if you somehow like 3-star Galio out of nowhere, just feel free to give him some items until you're able to hit Shen 2 and then give him leftover items. Pretty rare in this scenario. Obviously, it's not something that you look for, but hey, you got to make do with what you hit. Zeri is pretty much back in the metagame. There's a couple of variations that I'd like to show you. The first one is the most common one that you'll see, which is a Piltover start. The Piltover is pretty straightforward. If you're able to get three Piltover and get the T-Hex stacking very quickly through lose streak, not win streak, you're able to get a really strong T-Hex that acts as a secondary carry source for your team. The T-Hex ends up becoming really, really powerful. And even at times, if you're able to get it to like, you know, 40s and 50s stack, you can just even frontline the T-Hex that acts as a tank. Last Whisper is really important on Zeri because sundering the army is really crucial for success. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck on a tank. A lot of times I see people have like, Rage Blade, Giant Slayer, and uh, Infinity Edge, and you just don't have any Last Whisper to really convert off that AD. Generally, you still want to have Zeke's. One Zeke's is good enough for Jace, but if you do have multiple Zeke's for whatever reason in the late stages game, it's fine to stack them, but don't take extra Zeke's at the cost of other items. One is enough, basically. In fact, let me change this real quick and type it to one Zeke, so that way it feels a little bit more clear. Urgot is a unit again, so you can feel free to frontline him if he's two-starred. You can put things like Titan's BT. You can also play Vow and Warmogs if you get a really strong Zon mod for it, like Exoskeleton and just cleanse and just have him be a tank. Speaking of Zon mobs, uh, the best is still Virulent Bioware. They also fixed Robotic Arms, which should be much better on Zeri now, so you can give that a try. I mentioned Exoskeleton is really good on Urgot. You can also put the Unstable Chemtech on him for the explosions. In terms of the augments, a lot of times people actually take the Zon Crest so they can one hit four Zon really early, but even go for six Zon, which is really powerful if you end up getting that spot for it. If you do end up hitting six Zon, you cut things like the Scion instead you play Warwick and you look for Jarvan because Jarvan is particularly really, really good with the Unstable Chemtech mod. If you're able to get Unstable Chemtech mod plus a Zon emblem onto Jarvan, you basically solo frontline him and you backline everybody else, including the T-Hex. And this allows Jarvan to get surrounded. And then when he jumps in with his Cataclysm, he explodes and dies with his AoE. Which does mean, by the way, if you're able to get Warmogs on him, plural, you're about to see some fireworks. All you have to do is just see Jarvan explode one time with six Zon, and you'll start to see. With that overcharge damage with it, it's just absolutely bananas. Explosion deal 45% of your maximum HP. That's just so much DPS with Jarvan in particular. Pumping up is also an augment that as people are experimenting with lock, because it gives you a bunch of attack speed. Remember that with gunners, you get so much flat attack damage, and so you want to combine it with attack speed. This is a way that they synergize together and multiply with each other so you get more DPS. You don't want more AD with gunner because you get all that through the attacks last augment i point is metabolic accelerator basically if you're playing any kind of pilt over strategy the more health you can get the better so that way you sustain all those losses much easier they can come back and maybe even get a crazy t-hex this also applies to other hp augments like tiniest titans tiny titans or anything that helps give you that big power spike like last stand don't sleep on senna again and giving her items things like shojin senna can be really really clutch in the late stages of the game generically you want to keep her on the opposite side of zeri you could theoretically position like this if you want to agree senna and zeri but in reality most of the times you just keep zeri and senna on the other side so that way if your opponent has things like jarvan 
or whatever AoE, they're just not punishing you. Another thing worth noting is that you could just carry Jinx instead. Let's say you end up hitting Robotic Arm Jinx, which is a really, really powerful combination as we talked about in previous videos, and you end up going for things like Runin's Last Whisper and Rage Blade. Jinx can also totally carry, especially if you get the six Zon, she's still really, really fearsome. Remember, TX is also a two ranged unit, so you want to keep it generally in row two. And generally, when you have things like Shroud and Zephyr and whatnot, you can always put it on Vi because Vi is very positionally flexible. It does not really matter as long as she's in front of your units. If you do end up hitting Orn items, I would recommend the generic frontline ones like we usually do. Death Defiance is also surprisingly really good on Urgot. In fact, if you look at almost all Orn effects, it's very good on Urgot. Let's say you get a random Hole Crusher, Urgot can take that. If you get a random Triforce, Urgot's also good with that. I mean, sometimes I've even put Trickster Glass on Urgot and ended up being really happy with it. Which, by the way, does end up making Urgot a really good holder of the Blacksmith Thief's Gloves, which is the TG of Orn Artifacts. He can use so many of these ones really well randomly that you might as well just throw it on him if you get Capricious Forge. So I mentioned a second variation of Zeri, and this is the other one you can play, which is Frailure and Zeri. You do have Piltover as an option, but you could totally cut it if it's not working. Let's say instead of Echo and Jace, you're just playing around Jinx instead, and then you find Warwick, which is totally fine, or maybe the Zon plus one, you put it on Sejuani. But the idea is that Freljord helps shred for the Zeri and offers you even a Deadeye Link with Ash. And so if you do end up doing this, you end up wanting to making a lot more of a straight up offensive setup. This is a spot where you can put, go for just straight up Rage Blade and Death Blade is a lot more acceptable because you're not amplifying nearly as much through Gunner. You're only getting six instead of 11 per stack. And then of course, don't forget about things like Guard Breaker and GS, which are good damage amplification and helps Zeri execute. And of course you give things like uh, Sejuani a bunch of tank items. Urgot can take the usual stuff. Although Urgot, when you're just trying to rely on him for more damage source, you can give, give him Death Blade and let's say an Edge of Night. Obviously, if you're not playing Piltover, Vi is less valuable, so just go ahead and play Scion in this spot. If you're not opening up Piltover and loose streaking, an early buildup that you can play around is through Tristana, Drinks, and Warwick. I like putting Set as well because he's just a juggernaut and pretty tanky. Plus, it doesn't feel bad to give him items whatsoever. Just give him some defensive items generically and just let Tristana and Jinx just hold anything. Don't be afraid of just throwing random Zon mods onto Warwick as well if you don't want to commit to it. So let's say you just find the Exoskeleton. Don't put it on Jinx, put it on Warwick instead. Let's say you find Jace. You can go ahead and play Jace and three Gunners. Even if it's just three Gunners, the fact is Jace is such high value for your setup. So you might as well include it. Let's say instead of finding that, you just find Irelia and Jin. You can play this as your level six. It's totally acceptable, even though it's kind of awkward because you feel like you want to hold items on Jin and the gunners I, I think a lot of people just underestimate just playing two bruisers as well generically to keep your frontline strong so you hear you have two bruisers two juggernauts two gunners just generically good flexible tft and then instead of tristana you find jace and instead of warwick you find the echo and all of a sudden you're in piltover it's okay if you play mid-game piltover although just don't expect to rely on the t-hex in fact in spots like this i end up probably trying to sell the t-hex if it ends up being a spot where i need more value and then put more raw power into other things. If you do end up selling T-Hex, that's probably a sign that you don't play Piltover in the late game, and you take out things like Vi and Echo and don't play around for Zon. Instead, go for a more powerful core that we talked about, like with Freyly or other things. At level 7, you're looking and rolling for Zeri finally, and if you do end up keeping Tristana to play for Gunner, good for you. If you do find a plus 1 Gunner, you can also play around that as well. And then finally, Urgot. I do want to note that people might have questions about 6 Gunner. 6 Gunner is also very good, so if you have an opportunity to play 6 Gunner, you should try to go for it. But if you do end up finding 6 Gunner, you do end up wanting to have plus 2, which is also really good with those galaxies that give you that extra slot. You're talking about things like the Maris or the God's Willow Grove. So because of pumping up, I recommend trying this composition with Master Re in particular. Otherwise, you can just play whatever you want with Orn, Bard, Ezreal, Poro, etc. Noxus is still really good in the metagame and particularly powerful if you're able to get the early game stacks. That's the number one priority that you want because the faster you can get those stacks, the more likely you are to snowball and win the game. Darius items really haven't changed very much. Giant Slayer is becoming more important for Darius so you can get past tanks that are really tanky. So a lot of times people end up wanting to replace things like Infinity Edge if they say play a Titan's Resolve or, you know, one of those Ornn items like Death Defiance. In reality, a lot of items for Noxus don't really matter nearly as much as wind streaking and getting your stacks because uh, the way to think about it is if you are able to get your stacks going, then that compensates for your lack of BIS. Also, just realize I'm playing two dares on the board, which don't do. Just, just, just play, just play one. <laughs> those are the combat augments. Things like total domination makes a lot of sense to synergize with the Noxes to get those executes and snowballing. I picked know your enemy because if you can get past one unit, you start to reset, and that makes Darius really powerful. But 
any generic damage amplification is really good. Unified Resistance ends up being a really common augment that you can pick as well because it just synergizes with the fact that you front row everything and you just have a bunch of resistances on your Darius and your Katarina, making them really tanky. If you do end up getting an emblem, just like last time we talked about, a really good holder of it is Echo because Echo is particularly strong with all those stats. In fact, if you have an opportunity to hit Echo 3, he's still really, really good. And because Rogue is allegedly fixed in the patch, uh, you have the opportunity to get back on access. And a lot of people are playing Lux, Aphelios, and a bunch of other units that just sit in the back line. Right now, Katarina and Echo can really feast. The buildup of Noxus is pretty straightforward. You pretty much just want to roll for those six Noxus units. So when I say roll on six, just roll for these six units. If you do have the emblem, just roll for Echo or Warwick instead. But in terms of the early game, it's a little bit different and sometimes nuanced, depending on how your opener is. If you get an early Darius, for example, you want to play around the Juggernaut so you can play Warwick instead. And if you do end up finding, say, Katarina, and you're like, ooh, but Kled is two-star, I don't want to take out Darius or two-star Samira, just, just play a fourth Noxus. You get all those stacks anyways, and that Katarina will be likelier to help you get those stacks because she does a lot of damage. Let's say at six, you aren't able to find the six Noxus, then what do you do? Just play good units around your core, so... Let's say you find a Zed and all of a sudden you two-star that Zed. And, you know, maybe instead of having Warwick and Kled, you find just like the classic Ionia core. So now you have three Noxus, three Ionia, and you're able to get that done. Well, in this case, I'd probably not play Jin and try to look for Set, but you get what I mean because the Juggernaut's really good here. In terms of positioning, you generally want to keep Darius and Katarina around the same side because then they're more likely to get the execution together. And the faster you can get Darius to kill a unit, the more he'll reset and get more casts. Sometimes, though, if you play long distance pals, you do want to separate them. Or if they punish a lot of clumping and, you know, really make sure that Darius and Katarina aren't together, you can go ahead and separate them. There's another variation that I've covered with Noxus that you should definitely give it a try if you have an opportunity to, which is Noxus with Sharima. And that's usually through a Noxus emblem on either Nasus or Seer. This is a little bit on the weaker side these days, but it's still something that you can play. And it's also very, very fun if you get Nasus going. If you do end up doing this, make sure you get the big stacks on Nasus with a bunch of items like Warmogs and Bramble. In terms of legend recommendations, I'd probably just choose generically like whatever you want to play. Honestly, the whole point of why Noxus is good, because it's dependent on your opener and not really your legend. But if you were to play, say, Orn, you probably want things like this Death Defiance. I've seen people play Triforce on Darius. It's totally fine. Maybe even Obsidian Cleaver. So that way, Last Whisper replacement for Darius. And yes, you can play Last Whisper on Darius. Deathfire Grass is also really good on Katarina in particular to help her new tanks. But outside of that, I don't really want to like do too much more. So again, just play around whatever you hit. If you want more information and tech on how to play Noxus, check out the other video where I pretty much covered the same concepts. And that carries over to this patch as well. So there you have it, my top comps for climbing this patch that are the most common and solid to play. However, that's not all the compositions that are really good. In my next video, I'm also going to be covering some underplayed compositions that I think have potential to really break out. So keep an eye out for that, and I'll see you guys in the next one.